The Cosmos, a continuing source of fascination. In this feature we'll be looking at the part it's played since the start of the scientific revolution 400 years ago, and the part it could play in our future. A long-running exhibition at the Science Museum in London explores the history of stargazing and how it fit into cultures ancient and modern. It's called Cosmos and Culture and contains instruments from throughout the ages. This is James Naismith's telescope. He built it himself in 1848 and used it to map the craters of the moon. Movements in the cosmos have been used by clairvoyants to predict the future for millennia. This tapestry mocks King Charles I for following astrology-based advice from his queen Henrietta Maria. In the recent annual science lecture at the Natural History Museum, astronomer royal Martin Rees talked about the cosmos and our place in it. Now, tonight's speaker is the Astronomer Royal and Emeritus Professor of Cosmology and Astrophysics at the University of Cambridge, and has been an active member of the House of Lords since 2005. In addition, he served with great distinction as President of the Royal Society for five years, finishing his term in 2010. As one of the world's most esteemed astronomers and author of more than 500 papers, Professor Rees's work has touched on some of the greatest questions about our universe, from quantum physics to black holes. So would you please give a, 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 a round of applause and welcome to the stage, Professor Martin Rees. Martin. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great privilege to be giving a lecture in this series, and it's really daunting to be speaking in this iconic building. Darwin's Cathedral. Well, astronomers go back before Darwin's simple beginning, which was the young Earth. We try to understand how the sun and planets formed and to trace the atoms they're made of right back to a so-called Big Bang, where everything began nearly 14 billion years ago. This is the mirror mechanism used in the FIRAS instrument to measure radiation from the Big Bang. It was launched into space in 1990 and measured the radiation spectrum. The radiation itself was first detected in 1964 and was a breakthrough for our theory of the cosmos. Astronomy is really the grandest of the environmental sciences. Indeed, the night sky is the only part of our environment that's been shared by all humans, wherever they've lived in the world, throughout history. They've all looked up at the vault of heaven wandered at the stars and interpreted them in their own way. The first telescopes were built in the early 1600s. This is a replica of Galileo's telescope, and in front is a replica of Newton's first reflecting telescope that used mirrors instead of lenses to focus light. Mirrors continued to be used. This is the Great Ross built by Lord Ross in 1845 in the Midlands. It was the largest in the world for over 70 years and held this six-foot mirror which allowed him to gather enough light to see objects much further away than had previously been possible. Ross was the first to notice the spiral structures of light that would later be named galaxies. The most successful telescope of all time for exploring our solar system and beyond is the Hubble Space Telescope. It was launched in 1985 and this is a 1 to 10 scale model. The original was about the size of a single decker bus, which was the largest object that could fit into a space shuttle at the time. There are other successful telescopes in space. The Cassini space probe carried in its cargo bay a European robotic craft called Huygens, whose job was to land on Titan, the giant moon of Saturn. Titan has an atmosphere, so it landed with a parachute, and it was a great achievement of robotics. This is an example of what robots can do, and I would hope that during the coming decades, the entire solar system will be explored and mapped by flotillas of tiny robotic craft. No one expects anything very advanced in our solar system, but there are various places where people have been or are looking for traces of life. And even the most vestigial trace will be very important, because if we could show that life had originated elsewhere in our solar system and be sure it was an independent origin, then that would tell us straight away that life must be widespread in the universe because if something happens twice in one solar system, 
then it's going to happen zillions of times altogether. Whereas so long as we only have one instance of life, we can't assess the odds at all. As Lord Rees has just explained, the presence of life anywhere in our solar system is one of the crucial discoveries for astronomy still to make. It would all but confirm the existence of aliens. But this discovery may never happen. Perhaps ET doesn't exist. Earth's intricate biosphere may be unique. And that would disappoint the searchers, of course, but it would have its upside, because it would entitle us to be less cosmically modest, because our tiny planet could then be the most important place in the galaxy. Perhaps even a seed from which life could spread through the entire galaxy in the far future. So how much can we know about the far distant universe? Well, we have huge samples of galaxies to study, but we're rather helpless, really, because we can't do experiments on them. So how can we understand what they're made of? Physicists who study particles can probe them and crash them together in accelerators, like the LHC at Geneva. We can't crash galaxies together, and galaxies change so slowly that we only see a snapshot of each one. But we can do experiments in a virtual universe inside our computer. We can ask what happens if two galaxies are crashed together. It's likely that some of the most interesting astronomical discoveries over the coming decades will be made with the help of computers. And just as Newton's laws of motion were used to explain the movement of planets, so the new laws and hypotheses of the workings of our universe will be keyed into computer simulations and help us understand more about astronomical puzzles like dark energy and the nature of black holes. In the sky we discover not only our place in the wider stellar community, but also our history. When Dylan Thomas talked of the heads of the characters hammering through daisies, he referred to the creation and recycling of atoms in the universe, a process that's been going on since the dawn of time. All of our bodies contain carbon, oxygen, iron, made in ancient stars. Indeed, we contain atoms from thousands of different stars which lived and died all over our Milky Way galaxy. They died more than four and a half billion years ago and the solar system condensed from debris contaminated by the ejector. So we are the ashes of long dead stars. We feel less romantic. We are the nuclear waste from the fuel that makes stars shine. Me in thanking Professor Martin Reese. <laughs>